Well, let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for your love to us. Thank you for being a very present help in time of trial. Uh, we pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us today to be willing to give all that only Jesus would be seen in our lives. In his name we pray, amen. I'd like to start with uh, something I've just finished actually. Uh, but I'm about to start reading the book again because uh, it's one of those books that you can read it again and again and again and you're always going to get something more out of it. Uh, just a great blessing, a great blessing. You know, when you think about what Joseph went through in his in his lifetime, uh, at 17, being sold as a slave. A uh, few years after that, being thrown into a prison. Uh, a few years after that, being elevated to the uh, second highest place in all of the greatest nation at that time on the face of the earth in Egypt. And I look at that and I say, what kept him? We, you know, and somebody would say, well, God kept him. Yeah, but, but where and when and how did that message get across to that young man? You know, and as I'm reading through this book by Carlisle Haynes, Carlisle B. Haynes, it's called God Sent a Man. You know, it talks about the fact that in the travels of Jacob, who is now Israel. Uh, he comes back to Canaan from Haran, uh, from being there with Laban and all that mess for 20 plus years. And he finally comes back to Canaan. Of course, he meets Esau in that famous uh, trial in um, Genesis chapter 32. But then he moves, he keeps moving south in, in the land of Canaan comes to Beersheba, which is way in the south, southern part of Israel, and there is his long, uh, long lost father, Isaac, who he had not seen for 20 plus years. And there is uh, Isaac living out his final days. Well, friends, in that scenario, Carlisle B. Haynes Points, pinpoints the fact that here was this young boy by the name of Joseph and he would go over uh, to visit his grandfather Isaac and he'd say grandfather tell me a story tell me about the God of our fathers tell me what he's done in your life and Joseph now th this is an embellishment but it could very well be true one of Joseph's, and I'll picture it that way, one of his favorite stories was when Isaac and his father, Abraham, went to Mount Moriah. And Isaac tells the story of how they go up the mountain together, Mount Moriah, and they're going up the mountain and they've got everything they need for the sacrifice. They've got the wood. They've got the fire. They've got, oh, wait a minute. They don't have the sacrifice. But Isaac, who is absolutely obedient to his father, absolutely obedient, doesn't say a word. He just figures, well, you know, they'll get a sacrifice somewhere. They're heading up the mountain. They put the wood in place. Abraham is 
doing the different little things to get it ready. And then all of a sudden, Isaac says, Father, where, we, we've got this, the uh, altar ready, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham, in those famous gut-wrenching words, he says, My son, God will provide himself uh, a sacrifice. Well, it was then that Abraham had to tell Isaac that he was to be the sacrifice. And Isaac, again, absolutely obeyed his father. His father was law. His father was law. Whatever his father said, that was it. There, there was no, uh, well, what about this? Or, I think this. No. Abraham was Isaac's dad, and dad's word was law. Children, don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. Dad's word when dad speaks, that's it. That's it. So Abraham says, Isaac, you are to be the sacrifice. Isaac is placed on the altar. Abraham lifts the knife. And, and here is this old man, Isaac, telling the story. He sees the end of the knife and he sees that it's about to come right into him when God says, Abraham, Abraham, stop. And in that moment, Isaac learned what Mount Moriah taught. I mean, it taught many, many lessons, but one of them was God will see to it. God will provide. God will take care of his children. What, what an incredible testimony. And friends, that testimony lived in the heart of Joseph for the rest of his life. It lived there. God will see to it. So friend, whatever the situation you're involved in, God will see to it. Let's trust him. Paul? Just real quick, you, you mentioned that, you know, Abraham was law to Isaac. Hmm. However, Abraham earned that. Oh. He saw how his father ruled how his father dealt with things and he had great respect for him just like Jesus earned our respect at Calvary he didn't just demand it you have to listen to me regardless so Definitely. fathers need to earn their children's respect also by living and being an example of Jesus to the family amen Paul great point great point Jehovah Jireh, Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. That kept Joseph as he went in that Ishmaelite caravan to Egypt. That kept Joseph in Potiphar's home when he was evilly accused of something he did not do it kept him friends and it will keep us you know this morning the title of our talk as you can see it Jesus versus Jan Pauline part 27 this is the life of Christ but I've entitled it Jesus versus Jan Pauline. Now, of course, Jan Pauline is the religion professor out at Loma Linda University. Um, so why title it this? Well, we're going to pick up a very familiar story in the life of Christ today. And we're going to look at it in the light of things that Jan Pauline has said and in the light of 
the closing scenes of earth's history. But what I want to do this morning, I'm going to change it up a little bit. I want to look right in Matthew 15 to begin uh, the talk this morning. Matthew chapter 15, because what Jesus said in Matthew 15, 1 to 9, has told us unequivocally what the final events of earth's history will be about. What the final battle will be over. And Matthew chapter 15 gives us the answer. And it puts egg all over this man's face. Matthew 15. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem saying, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Well, what do you have here? What's the issue? Right off in Matthew 15 and verse 2. Well, it says, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? There was some tradition that the Jews in the first century, in the times of Jesus, there was a tradition that the Jews had exalted as paramount. It was critical. The disciples didn't wash their hands when they ate bread. And that was a tradition that everybody had to follow. So the scribes and Pharisees were exalting man-made traditions. Verse 3, But he, Jesus, answered and said to them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So the context now in Matthew 15 is over traditions of men that have no place in the Bible versus God's commandments. Now, it, that's so blatantly obvious that that's what's going on here. Verse 3 again, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and said, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect, by your tradition. So what is the issue here? Again, the traditions of men versus the commandments of God. It couldn't be any plainer. And Jesus illustrated that with something that was very well known in Christ's day. Because in Christ's day, the Jews had established a tradition. It was called Corban. And in this tradition, if a young person growing up and now an adult had quite a bit of income, quite a bit of money, and the parents were needy, Instead of honoring their parents, as the commandment said, a young person, a wealthy young adult, could say to their parents, Corban. And thus, by simply saying Corban, they didn't have to honor their parents at all. And Jesus said, you have made God's commandment to honor your parents. You have made it of none effect by your tradition.
tradition. Cody? Uh, I don't know if it's intentional or not. I know you, you haven't even gotten past the, the title slide here, so I'll be brief. But uh, I'm seeing a pattern already with the respecting of, of your parents here that was brought up by Paul. I don't know, know if that was intentional or not with, with everything. But when I think about Isaac, what proved that he respected and loved his father was that he was obedient to him. So what would disprove that was if he was disobedient to him. Mm -hmm. Like what's going on in this Corbin situation. And if we've been given as a people the spirit of prophecy for the last days, the context is for the last days, whenever that happens. Not the 1800s, not the 1900s, not the 2000s. The last days before the plagues, that's the context. So anybody who deviates away from that through their tradition they're dishonoring their father in heaven. And it's proof Amen. positive to me that those who believe that, uh, along with the person who teaches it, does not respect their father in heaven because they would be obedient to him and to his words. They would seek to be students at the feet of the spirit of prophecy and the Bible rather than to take it, manipulate it, and make it say what they want to say. Absolutely, Cody. Good point. Good point. Jesus goes on in Matthew 15 and verse 7 and says, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now in verse 9, Jesus sums it all up in this one passage, and he says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So folk, teaching man-made traditions is vain worship. To the contrary, teaching God's commandments is true worship. So there you have the great crux the great issue that we see here in Matthew 15, the commandments of God, true worship, the traditions of men, false worship. Paul? Real quick, uh, what you're talking about, it's in the testimonies, I don't know which volume, however, in testimony treasures, it's in volume two, uh, around, it's in section 48 where Mrs. White says, in the time that we are in, and I'm paraphrasing, traditions and so-called science would take over the church just as in the first century, but the deception would be more complete. This is exactly what you're talking about. Absolutely. I'm saying what Mrs. White would have said or should have said. Well, we know better. We're scholars. She, she wasn't. Yeah. Appreciate that, Paul. Absolutely, that's exactly what we're talking about here. And what Jesus has outlined here in Matthew chapter 15 is absolutely critical in the light of end time events and in the light of, as Paul just brought out, the exaltation of man-made traditions above God's ten commandments. Now we're going to get to the slides momentarily, but I want us to see again Matthew 15, true worship following God's commands, false worship honoring man-made traditions. So what is the great issue that we find in Revelation chapters 13 and 14. Well, what is it? What is the great core final issue going to be in the great controversy at the end of time? Now, a lot of people today want to bring up side issues and make them the, the final uh, 
event, the, the final crux of what will be the great issue at the end of time. You know, in Adventism, we have so many, it's, it's hard to keep up with them anymore. You know, well, let's see, the, the great issue at the end of time is uh, over the Godhead and whether the Holy Spirit is a person or, you know, uh, the name of Yahweh is, is the great final issue at the end of time. Or um, the church is Babylon, or you have to be saved in the church, or, you know, you have to keep the feast days, or, you know, all these things that Seventh-day Adventists have come up with to say, these are, one of these is the final issue at the end of time. Uh, some will say 2520 or the flat earth or all these other things. Well, let's see what the Bible says. I mean, what a novel idea that is, isn't it? <laughs> so novel. Revelation chapters 13 and 14. I want you to notice what the great issue is over at the end of time. Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He spake as a dragon. Now, of course, we fully understand that to be the United States of America. Begins with a lamb-like government, a, a government of liberty and freedom and uh, the right to worship God and the right to free speech and free expression, but would end up speaking as a dragon, taking, all, taking away all those freedoms. Verse 12, He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. And of course, we understand the first beast in Revelation 13, 1 to 10, to be the papal power, the, the Roman system. It's very clear when analyzing all those symbols in Revelation 13, 1 to 10. Well, the Bible goes on and says, And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Worship? Has anybody heard of worship before Revelation 13? That was exactly what we read in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 9. The issue was over worship, the commandments of God versus man-made traditions that are exactly contrary to God's Ten Commandments. So, the Bible tells us that the United States of America, in union with the Roman Catholic system, will implement and force traditions of the papacy that are directly contrary to God's commandments. Now that's what Revelation 13 verse 12 says. And them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Then, of course, we know miracles, uh, supposed miracles will take place right before our eyes, friends. And that there will be an image of the beast which we clearly understand to be apostate Protestantism. So these three entities, America, papacy, and apostate Protestants, will unite together to force traditions of men that are directly contrary to the commandments of God. Now that's what we see right here in Revelation 13, verses 11 through 14. Now, let's read one other verse in, verse in chapter 13. 
He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. What's the issue, friends? It's over worship. And obviously, the fact that apostate Protestantism has to use force and threats, this is false worship. So, the Bible says in Revelation 13, in light of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, the final issue at the end of time will be the commandments of God versus a tradition of Romanism that's directly contrary to one of God's commandments. God says this. The papacy says this. And it will be over that issue that all the inhabitants of earth will have to make a decision. And based on what Revelation 13 verse 15 says, it will become a life and death decision. Because again it says, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Commandments of God, traditions of Rome and apostate Protestantism. There's your final issue at the end of time. It's not over the 2520. <laughs> that's a side, that's a distraction. That's what that is. It's a distraction from the real issue. The feast days, the, the Holy Spirit, not a person, the you know, Yahweh, it's all distraction, friends. It's all distraction. And it's distractions to an extreme. That's an extreme distraction from the core final issue at the end of time. Now, to further highlight this, notice in your Bibles in Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, verse 7 and verse 9. Notice what the Bible says. What a novel idea. <laughs> novel idea. Revelation 14, verse 7 says, Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Fear God, give glory to him, the hour of his judgment. And what was that next word? And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So, this is true worship, correct? Correct? So, based on what Revelation 14, 7 is saying, we need to honor the commandment of him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So, there must be a commandment. There must be a commandment in the Ten Commandments that talks about God being our creator. Because that's exactly what Revelation 14, 7 says. To honor the commandment of him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, do you know in all the Ten Commandments, are there any commandments in the Bible, in Exodus chapter 20, 
that pinpoint the fact that God is our creator? Is there a commandment to that effect? Well, Exodus chapter 20, let's see what it says. Don't take, don't bow down to images. Don't have any gods before him. Don't take God's name in vain. Well, let's see, what, what's the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, thy cattle, thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, Revelation 14, 7 says to honor the commandment that points to God as our creator. Exodus chapter 20 tells us what commandment that is. It's the seventh day Sabbath or Saturday. From Friday when the sun goes down till Saturday when the sun goes down. You say, Bill, why are, why are you specifying that and saying, well, it's Saturday from sundown Friday to sundown Sabbath? Well, friends, because there are a lot of people today that believe in the lunar Sabbaths, and they will tell you the Sabbath can fall on any day of the week based on the new moon. Well, friend, excuse my English, but that's a bunch of hooey. That's a bunch of garbage. <laughs> uh, no offense. No offense to the, the lunar Sabbath people, but they're absolutely wrong. The Sabbath is from Friday when the sun sets till Saturday when the sun sets. Period. End of story. End of discussion. So Revelation 14 enjoins the seventh day Sabbath. That's what it says. But Revelation 14 and verse 9 talks about another kind of worship. Revelation 14, 9 says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man, well, there's that word again, Worship. But this time it's not true worship. This time it's false worship. And it says, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Friends, here again in Revelation 14 7, we have true worship. We have the Sabbath. Revelation 14, 9, we have false worship. We have the papacy and apostate Protestants exalting something, a tradition that is exactly opposite of the seventh day Sabbath. Now, what could that possibly be? Verse 9, clearly the papacy and apostate Protestants are exalting a tradition that is exactly contrary to the Seventh-day Sabbath. Could the Bible be any clearer? Could it be any clearer? Clearly, the tradition that is exactly the opposite of the commandment of God, the seventh day Sabbath, or Saturday, the fourth commandment, clearly the tradition of the papacy and apostate Protestants is what? 
What could it be? It's Sunday worship. That is a tradition of men. It's a tradition of Rome that has no basis in the Word of God at all. And there is the great, the final issue in the great controversy Sabbath, Sunday. One showing absolute respect for what God has said and a submission to his authority as our creator and as our savior and that's what the Sabbath is all about to the contrary the Sunday tradition is the tradition of Rome that is rebellion, that is rebellion against the authority of God. Now, how many quotes, how many quotes have we used from Ellen White to this juncture? Zero. None, niet, the empty set. We haven't used any. We have simply looked in Matthew 15, Revelation 13, and Revelation 14. Jesus, in Matthew 15, laid bare the commandments of God versus the traditions of men, true worship versus false worship. That's what Jesus said. And John the Revelator in Revelation 13 and 14 laid bare the final issue. So if somebody comes to you today and says, well, you know, the final issue in earth's history is it's, um, it's the feast days. Well, you know what, friends? Very graciously and very firmly, you can look at them and say, you're wrong. And then go on. The issue is over worship. Plain and simple. Now, let's take a look at a few slides. Dr. Jan pa John Pauline, a leading scholar and professor at Loma Linda University. What? Okay, he's a scholar now, friends. Let's see what this scholar and professor has said. The coming Sunday law dilemma. It's a dilemma? A dilemma indicates a problem. Is there a problem in understanding the great issue at the end of time? I didn't see any problem in Revelation 13 and 14. Did you? You know, friend, years ago, when we mass mailed the secret terrorist book to three towns in southern Oregon, uh, Myrtle Point, Bandon, and uh, there was one other one. I don't remember the name of it now, but we mass mailed that area with the secret terrorists, invited, invited everybody to a meeting, meetings. Well, a Catholic priest and his secretary showed up to the meetings. And they were surrounded by Adventists who were sitting in their vicinity. And we were looking in Revelation 13 and 14 at the great issue at the end of time. When we came to true worship, honoring the seventh day Sabbath, versus false worship, honoring the Sunday tradition of the papacy, the church secretary of this Catholic priest turned to the priest and said, Hughes doesn't know what he's talking about. And the Catholic priest turned to the woman and said, Don't be so sure about that. 
This Catholic priest, steeped in Romanism, he saw the truth, friends. He saw the truth of Revelation chapter 14. But Jan, John Pauline is saying there's a dilemma? I think there's a dilemma in his brain. That's where the problem is. It's not with will there or will there not be a Sunday law. The dilemma that Dr. Pauline was inferring was that there was no Sunday law forthcoming. Oh, really? Now, what do we have here, friends? For John Pauline to say, there's not going to be a Sunday law. Well, now what we've done is we have taken both extremes. We've got the extremes in Adventism that will tell us, you know, the great issue at the end of time, it's all these ridiculous doctrines. It's the 2520, it's the flat earth, it's... The Holy Spirit isn't a person. It's the feast days. It's, uh, you know, God doesn't kill. There, there you've got that one extreme going way out there. Distractions, that's all they are. They're distractions. And then you have the other extreme. And what is the other extreme? Right here, John Pauline. There's no Sunday law coming. <laughs> oh, really? There is a dilemma here, friends. And it's right there in that man's brain. That's where the problem is. But the Bible, crystal clear. Crystal clear. Now, when John Pauline was introduced, when he talked about the Sunday Law Dilemma, I want you to hear what they said. Our speaker tonight, as we come to the conclusion of this symposium, is Dr. John Pauline. Dr. Pauline is a legend in the Adventist church when it comes to the book of Revelation. Really? How is that possible that he understands the book of Revelation when he's saying there's no Sunday law coming? Because we just saw in Revelation 13 and 14 that the great issue at the end of time was over Sunday versus Sabbath. Is this man a legend when it comes to the book of Revelation? I think he's a liar. I think he's a liar, friends. He's this big in name scholar that's been at it for a long time. He knows his stuff inside and out. You know, I would have to disagree. Because if he doesn't see a Sunday law in Revelation 13 and 14, he's got a real dilemma. He's got a real dilemma. All I would like to say tonight in the introduction tonight is thank you, sir. And all I would say to that thanks is, ah. The new contemporary interpretation about the mark of the beast, according to Dr. Pauline, is that the text of Revelation describes a counterfeit and not specifically Sunday. Really? Really? So what is the tradition in Revelation 14 and verse 9? What is the tradition that the papacy and apostate Protestants will pawn off on this world that is the exact opposite of the Seventh-day uh, Seventh Sabbath? What is the counterfeit? You tell me, friends. What is it? It can only be Sunday. Dr. Pauline, 17 minutes, 45 seconds into his talk. The biblical evidence does not speak of Sunday as such. Really? I just saw it in Revelation 14. Clear as a pane of glass. 
It's not there, huh? It speaks about a counterfeit of the Sabbath being critical to the mark of the beast at the end of time. We notice that there were four possibilities. One would be a different day than the Sabbath. Sunday would be an example of that. It's not just an example of that. It is that. A second option is that every day is the Sabbath, which means that no day would have any special significance. The third is that no day is the Sabbath. Sabbath was abolished by Jesus, therefore we can worship on any day that we choose. There is a dilemma here, friends. There's a dilemma. And it's right there. There's something going on in this man's brain that doesn't allow him to wrap it around what Revelation 13 and 14 have to say. That's where the problem is. I want to thank, before I go on very quickly, I want to thank Advent Messenger for researching this, Andy Roman, uh, for researching this and trying to make Seventh-day Adventists aware of the bold-faced apostasy within the denomination that is coming from Loma Linda and other places. Options as to what the mark of the beast is? The Sabbath is abolished. It will not be part of end-time events. You know what that is, friends? That's this right here. You know what that is right there? That's a pile of garbage. That's what that is, friends. It's a pile of garbage. It's dangerous, friend, to listen to a scholar. Beware of intelligent people who don't know what they are talking about. Beware, friends. Beware. And then John Pauline says Ellen White would see things different today if she were alive now. Really? Would Ellen White see things differently, friends? Where, where did Ellen White get the idea that Sabbath and Sunday would be the core issue at the end of verse history? Where did she get that idea, friends? Did she just, you know, pull it out of a, a hat like a magician does? Or did she pull it from behind somebody's ear and say, oh, here it is. Friends, Ellen White and the early Seventh-day Adventists were Bible students. They studied their Bibles. They saw exactly what you and I saw at the beginning of this talk. That's what they saw. They compared Matthew, Revelation 13, Revelation 14. And they saw the final issue at the end of time. Would Ellen White change her view now? What, does the Bible change now, friends? The Bible would not change, and neither would Ellen White. This is that right there. And again, the dilemma is in John Pauline's fevered, fevered, brain 27th minute he says our careful study of fulfilled prophecy out of careful study from the book of revelation and reading these statements from ellen white with the biblical principles in mind we should be careful not to assume that the end time will be identical to the great controversy in every detail 
Considering both the Bible and world history, were Ellen White alive today, there is at least a chance that her depiction of the end would be different than it was in the 1880s. Would it be different, friends? If Ellen White were standing where I am today, would she say something different than what's in the great controversy? Would she? Oh, friends. She would say the exact same thing. Why? Because what she said is in harmony with the Bible, and the Bible doesn't change. And Ellen White wouldn't change. That is why, thank you, Cody, great point. That is why they had to remove great chunks of the great controversy to establish the great hoax and have the great hoax handed out instead of the great controversy. Now, folk, again, where's the problem? The dilemma is in John Pauline's fevered brain. That's where the problem is. Revelation, Ellen White, Jesus himself in Matthew 15 totally disagree with John Pauline. The three sources of inspiration all taught there would be a Sunday law and they all totally disagree with him. This guy has not studied the book of Revelation. He has not studied Ellen White or Jesus at all, or he wouldn't make such foolish statements as that. I could go on, friends. There's so much more that John Pauline has said, but I need to close. And I will close with this. See, John Pauline gets away with this, friends. And my question would be, how long, how long are you going to support that? How long are you going to support that, friends? How long are you going to believe the insanity that this, because he's in Adventism, he's going through and the Adventist denomination is going through. Friends, think, think, please. This is not going through. Oh no, it is going to go through. It's going to go through to a lake called fire. That's where this is going. I don't care what your profession is, friend. This is heresy. Will you keep supporting it? Will you keep following the false idea that this is going through? Oh, friends. This is going to go to the lake. And if you're following this foolish man who's got scrambled brains, you'll go through with him and you'll end up in the same place. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the beauty of Scripture. Thank you for the harmony that we see in a book that's written hundreds of years apart, but it all harmonizes. Thank you for the beauty and the glory of your word. Thank you for the gift of the spirit of prophecy. 
that doesn't add any gems into your word. It simply shows us what's already there. We want to give you thanks for these great gifts that you've left to us. Help us to stand in defense of truth and right when the majority forsake us and to fight your battles when champions are few. In Jesus' name, amen.